Where does the world come from? Was it a god? Was it some primordial substance that transformed into all the stuff around us? Or was it all just some original process of physics, a chemical reaction on a grander scale? We don't know. We don't have the answer. We have ideas. Our first ideas were religious ones. The question, where do we come from, was answered with creation myths, like the Babylonian Enuma Elish, which tells us of the original gods, Apsu and Tiamat, back before the universe even existed. And we have Genesis, of course, in the Bible, with God creating the world in six days, beginning with heaven and the earth. Our ideas today are scientific. Physicists are still trying to figure out what was going on there in that split second between the Big Bang and the moment the laws of time and space took hold in the universe. They're still trying to answer that question, where do we come from? Where does it all come from? But another question might be, when did it happen that our answers to these questions stopped being about gods and started being about matter and energy and processes? How did we get from a religious account of the origin of the world to a scientific account? And that's the story I'm telling today. Sometime in the 6th century BC, in Miletus, a Greek colony in modern-day Turkey, a group of thinkers became the first men in history to approach these questions critically without resorting to myth, mysticism or magic. And for this reason, Today, these Milesians are heralded as the first philosophers and the original scientists. Patrick brings a certain something to the conversation around philosophy that I particularly find fascinating. Can you dig it? Oh my God, Patrick, you crack me up. Can you dig it? You go from talking about, about religion and Yahweh to a song about the cult of Moloch. <laughs> That's fucking classic. Love it. Can you dig it? Hello, humans. Welcome to The Great Everything, the world's only podcast dedicated to art, donuts, and transformation. I'm Patrick, a former banking lawyer who saw the light and quit to devote my existence to culture and philosophy, the greatest self-improvement tools of all. Great show today, man. Great show. You're always so busy creating all of this amazingness. Jeez, your show is just so stupid good. Today's episode of The Great Everything is an origin story. The birth of philosophy is something that I think is a very special moment in our story of being human. First of all, it's always valuable to look back at the classical world, antiquity, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. There's something about that world and what you can learn from it that is just unlike anything else. I studied classics as an undergraduate, and one of the things that I found most interesting about it is that it really gives you a deep insight into what is timeless about us human beings. When you're looking at the classical world, you're looking at stories and people that are biologically just like us. We have not evolved one jot since then. Yet, in many ways, the world they live in is so alien, so different from us. And in that weird and unique interplay between similarities and vast differences, you really get a good look at what it is that makes us all human. The birth of philosophy, which is part of the story of ancient Greece, is particularly crucial to us. Because there's many different ways of looking at it, at the story of philosophy, but one way, one pretty established way, is that philosophy is some kind of original discipline from which all the other disciplines kind of spin off. So when you're looking at philosophy, you're not just looking at the origins of one thing, but of many different things that have made us who we are today, that have made Western civilization what it is. And origin stories are always powerful because origins are interesting. Origins hold the seed, the key to understanding us. When you watch a superhero movie, the origin story is what tells you everything you need to know about that character. When you're watching a multi-season 
TV series with a big overarching villain that goes on throughout the whole show. There's always an episode, and it's usually later on in the series run, where you see everything from the point of view of the villain. And maybe you'll get that insight into the villain's origin story, into the circumstances and the traumas that made the villain into who he is. Through seeing the origin story of the villain, you get a real insight into his motivations, into what makes him who he is. Our origin stories, whether we're talking about the Big Bang, or the Bible, or the Bhagavad Gita, or the birth of philosophy, are all important because they give us a deep insight into who we really are. And this episode is an origin story in more ways than one. The earliest philosophers were known as the pre-Socratics, as in before Socrates. Socrates is traditionally seen as a dividing line in the history of early philosophy because he was asking a very different, a new set of questions and he was going about it in an innovative way that kind of set a new course for philosophy in its early maturity. They sometimes say that he was the first moral philosopher. He was probably not the first, but he certainly was the one who really put the focus on questions about what does it mean to live a good life? But the first philosophers are asking questions that are even more foundational. The first philosophers are a bit like the first humans, stumbling out of the caves into the light and just sort of finding their footing and then looking around themselves with a sense of awe and wonder and asking, what is this? How is this? They are asking questions about what's out there. What is it made of? What is the nature of reality? Where does the world come from? What are its building blocks? These are big picture, birth of the universe type questions. The kinds of questions physicists deal with today. So maybe we can consider these earliest philosophers, these pre-Socratics, as scientists, or at least as proto-scientists. And there's a lot we can learn from how they went about approaching these questions. Think about where they're coming from. A world where every answer on important matters is coming from some kind of higher authority. A king, a priest, a holy book of some sort. All unquestionable, all dogma. What makes these guys the first philosophers is that to them, nothing is unquestionable. They question the shit out of everything and they come up with their own answers using reason. And then they develop this habit of learning how to defend and justify those answers using reason and critical thinking. Nobody else is doing that in their time. And that's what's amazing. You see, all the other philosophers that we ever study They've inherited a tradition of this type of thinking. Sometimes this tradition is thousands of years old. But obviously, modern philosophers, they have thousands of years to look back at and learn from. But these earlier guys, these pre-Socratics, they are starting from scratch. This is something I love thinking about and repeating to the annoyance of all my friends. The difference between 1 and 100 is huge, but it's nowhere nearly as big as the difference between one and zero. Because the difference between something and more of something is a difference in quantity. But something from nothing is a difference in quality, a paradigm shift. These early philosophers, they pioneered critical thinking in a society where that skill couldn't have been all that popular. And I can think of other times and places where reason and critical thinking aren't that popular. And maybe in times like those, we could all use a little bit of that pre-Socratic chutzpah to fly in the face of convention, of authority, and question our dogmas and our received knowledge, and to arrive at our own answers using our brains, using reason, and not just what we hear from those we consider authorities.
Before we get into the first philosophers, let's ask, what was even first uh? After all, it's not like there wasn't already a rich intellectual tradition in the Mediterranean and around it, and we kind of have to be aware of what's going on in places like Egypt and Mesopotamia and, and Babylon, which is also in Mesopotamia, because these are places that the early Greeks are trading with, they're in contact with them, especially the Greek colonies in places like Turkey and Syria. So the Greeks are at least dimly aware of the big ideas, of the cultural achievements of these other civilizations. And these Eastern societies, like Babylon, they are usually priestly and military aristocracies that revolve around divine kings like uh, Ramses III or Hammurabi, rulers who have some kind of special relationship with the gods, or in some cases were actual gods themselves, like the pharaohs. So the starting point for culture, for knowledge, is authority the absolute religious authority of the king and his priests. And that authority can be enforced through violence of the military. In these Eastern societies, in our earliest cultures in the West and the Middle East, culture is something that comes from above. So you don't question it. Hammurabi's code, you know, the one, an eye for an eye, the first known set of laws, that was said to come straight from the god Marduk. So how are you going to question those laws? And what are you going to do? Are you Are going to question a god? But these cultures, they weren't just about religion. They developed other cultural forms like mathematics and geometry and astronomy. But, but these were all used in practical ways. Mathematics was for collecting taxes, for counting the bushels of grain, itemizing for making storage and inventory, and astronomy was mainly to be able to work out the seasons for harvest, for the crops. So it's all practical, and it's all coming from the admin, from the governmental bodies. So it has that backing of divine authority, or at least of you know threat of force if you question it. So it's not meant to be shared or spread or to be discussed openly. The ordinary individual, he has no role in this. He is at best a passive receiver of culture. Now, the earliest Greek thoughts that we have examples of are kind of similar to this. There's some differences, but a lot of similarities. First of all, there's definitely a strong religious element. Think of Homer's epics, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Everything that happens in those stories of the sack of Troy and uh, Odysseus's travels around the Mediterranean, everything that happens is because some god makes it happen. Aphrodite hands Helen over to the Trojan prince Paris, so she starts the war. Apollo starts a plague. Zeus gives Agamemnon a dream where he tells him to attack Troy. Neptune causes storms that strand Odysseus. Hera, she's always pissed off at someone, usually because of something Zeus did. Everything that is happening is happening because of gods. They are literally behind the natural phenomena, behind even the thoughts and the feelings and the passions that every human character has. The emotions are put into the characters by the gods. In fact, we can take it a step further. Even the telling of the story happens because of the gods. So if you're familiar with Homer's works, you'll know that they start with an invocation to the muse, to the goddess, to inspire him, the Iliad starts, Sing, goddess, about the dark, murderous rage of Achilles, son of Peleus. And the Odyssey starts, Sing to me, muse, of the man of many skills and great cunning, who after plundering Troy was driven off course again and again and wandered for many years. You see, Homer, the poet, if he even was just one guy, he's not telling the story. He's just the channel for the story. It's the goddess, the muse that is telling the story, that is singing through him. And then you have this other fucker, Hesiod. Hesiod is a Greek poet, and we're talking around 750 BC, which, just to give you some perspective, is 250 years before this is Sparta. He's 300 years before Athens was, you know, top dog. 350 years before Socrates. So this is so far before Greece became the Greece we know that you could fit the entire history of the United States in this period and then some. So that's just to give you an idea. Hesiod writes an epic poem called Theogony. Literally, the birth of the gods, another origin story. This is a mythological account of the origins of the world. An early version of that first philosophical question, where does all this come from? 
And what Hesiod is doing in Theogony is collating various local myths about the origin of the world and putting them all together into a narrative form. And the result is this epic poem which, culturally to the ancient Greeks, is kind of like the equivalent of the Bible, of Genesis, to us. And together with Homer's epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, these are the Greek world's sacred texts. But even though these are mythological explanations of the world, similar to the Epic of Gilgamesh, we're already seeing one serious difference between the Greek approach to these questions and how the Egyptians and the Babylonians went about answering them. Because the guy giving us these stories, Hesiod, he's not a god or a king. He's not even a priest. He's just a poet, an ordinary guy, a commoner, with no power, with no authority. So what on earth could give him any authority to tell us, the people, how the world works, where it comes from. Well, just like Homer, Hesiod begins the Theogony with an invocation to the muse to inspire his poetry. But there's a difference. He begins the poem by saying, Let us sing, O muses, of the gods on Mount Helicon. Do you notice that? It's not, Sing through me, muse, like Homer humbly asked. It's, let us sing, muse. So Hesiod, just some humble poet, he's demanding a place at the storyteller's table, at the table of the people who decide how the story is told. You know how they say the history is written by the winners? That is a universal truth. The people who determine the narrative are the powerful. And he, just some nobody, he's saying, I'm telling the story now. I have authority to tell this story. Me, not a god, not a king, just a human with a voice. This is huge. But there's more. Hesiod says that the muse comes to him. And the muses, they all teach him this song, this story of the theogony of the birth of the universe and the gods. Then they instruct him to tell other people the story. And then they breathe into him a divine voice. And they give him a scepter the symbol of a king. Hesiod is claiming for himself the authority of an actual king to tell stories. He, an ordinary dude. Sure, he's a different kind of ordinary dude. He's a poet, someone who has a special relationship with the gods because of his inspiration. But still, we're talking about a commoner, not a king, not a priest. So in the Western tradition, knowledge no longer has to come from those in power. It can come from a talented individual. Someone with the ability, through his own skill, or maybe with the aid of the gods, to pierce through the deceptive veil of appearance, see the truth behind it, and then tell that truth to others. Someone like a poet, or a philosopher. So now we're beginning to see differences between the Eastern and the Western approaches to knowledge. They're both coming from a place of religion and superstition, but the former is more authoritarian and uh, pyramidal, <laughs> literally. The knowledge is trickling down from above, from a place of authority, from governmental bodies, from the king, from the gods themselves. Whereas the latter is slightly more open to individuals from lower down on the totem pole to step up and participate in the divulgation of knowledge. Why though? What is it that makes the Greeks so different? What is it that gives these Westerners this difference in attitude? We've explained what the difference is, but the question that I find fascinating is why them? I mean, if we take it for granted that we're all starting from the same position, you know, we, we, 150,000 years ago, we were all in caves. It didn't matter whether you were in China or in Africa or in America. Well, you wouldn't have been in America 150,000 years ago. But the fact is we were kind of more or less all in the same place. Then why would these people rather than those people develop certain cultural norms? And in attempting to answer this question, I have to give you a little disclaimer. Everything on The Great Everything is my opinion. It's my own worldview. It's me tying together different strands of knowledge into something coherent to give you a big picture into which you can then insert the individual bits of the puzzle and create your own ideas on how the world works and how it all fits together. It is, at the end of the day, my opinion, based on, well, you know, quite a lot of research at times, but still, you know, be like the Greeks. Don't take this as the gospel. So why the Greeks? 
When we think uh, Greek philosophy, Greek culture, we're thinking of places like Athens and Sparta and Thebes, you know, Greece. But the truth is, when we're talking about early Greek culture, you know, the first philosophers, we're not really talking about Greece at all. We're talking about colonies of the Greeks, cities founded by Greeks, but outside of Greece, in places like southern Italy and Sicily and Turkey. So you think about what it must have been like to form a colony back in those days, early in the history of our civilization. So you'd have a small city-state just kind of finding its legs, and then you'd send a couple of hundred men and women out into the unknown. These are exploring missions. They're going into territory that is potentially hostile, and often openly hostile. And to do this, obviously, you need able-bodied men. You need warriors in their prime who can defend these early settlements from attackers. I mean, if you're a native Turk in 1000 BC and suddenly you see a bunch of Greeks just landing on your shores and setting up a camp, you might want to attack them. So those Greeks, they need to be able to defend that. But also, the Greeks need people with different skills to be able to face all the unpredictable challenges of a new territory, of a new camp, of a new state. And it seems to me that in this kind of setup, teamwork, cooperation are the only way to ensure survival and the construction of a functioning society. I mean, you'd have leaders in this kind of setup. You'd have uh, warrior leaders. You'd have political leaders. You might have elders. But it seems likely that the warriors, the workers, the elders, they would have had long discussions and debates and arguments as to how to deal with the issues that kept popping up in the community, how to structure the community itself. So you wouldn't have just one guy handing down orders based on some divine authority that can't be questioned. But instead, you would have deliberation and debate, like you see in Native American tribes, for instance, you know, with people sitting around the campfire and discussing the issues, a bit like a proto-democracy. In a society like this, the individual matters. And we get glimpses of this as early as in Homer. So in the Iliad, there's this very famous episode where during the assembly, just consider that word, assembly. The Greeks, you know, they have autocratic leaders like Agamemnon and Menelaus, literally kings. But they still have assemblies where the warriors get to speak and vent. And during one of these assemblies, in the Iliad, this one soldier, this ugly fucker called Thersites, he has a go at King Agamemnon. And he accuses him of, hey, dude, you just sit on your ass all day, and yet you get the pick of all the treasure, all the bounty, you get the best women, despite it being lowly soldiers just like me who do all the work. So Thersites is basically a communist agitator of sorts. Now imagine some Babylonian farmer trying to pull this kind of shit and insulting the king or something. You'd have his head on a stake in a second. So the Greeks are different in a very crucial way. Everyone gets to speak up. And they might get punished for it, because Thersites, he gets punished. He gets beaten by Odysseus, and Odysseus threatens to have him stripped. But it's a social humiliation kind of punishment, rather than you know getting arrested and your head lopped off. We're seeing a greater freedom to voice unorthodox and even subversive viewpoints than ever before. And what's more unorthodox than saying that maybe, just maybe, the big grand question of where do we come from, the question asked by people like Hesiod, doesn't require an answer steeped in religion, in mythology. So now, let's zoom in on one of these early proto-democratic Greek colonies in Asia Minor on the coast of present-day Turkey, a city called Miletus. Miletus is the home of the first philosophers, the first people in the Western intellectual tradition to apply naturalistic, non-mythological explanations to natural phenomena, to openly reject the received wisdom of the religious status quo and the holy texts and come up with their own answers based on reason to the various questions about the world. And there were three of these uh, Milesian philosophers, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, in that order. Uh, that's not necessarily the order in which I'm going to talk about them, but it is the order of their succession in terms of who taught who, or at least as well as we know it. And they all have a common interest, which is trying to answer that question. What are the basic ingredients, the building blocks of the world? The Milesians are working against the backdrop of a Greek intellectual tradition 
that is so ancient, it's almost ingrained in the psyche, this belief that the world is based or made up of four elements, water, earth, air, and fire. Now, today we know that none of these are elements. You know, air is not an element. It's made up of elements. You know, water isn't an element and so on. Hydrogen is an element. But back then, you could see how they would think that these were the four main elements of existence. It's not just a Greek thing. Most cultures have this or some variant on it. So the Milesians would have had this basic understanding of the world as made up of four elements, but they want to go deeper. They want to ask, where do these elements come from? Are they the things that existed before anything else? Or perhaps is there one of them that is more important than the others? They are looking for the founding principle, the unifying element, the base substance that the world is made of. In Greek, this is called arche, broadly speaking, the origin. Now, Hesiod thought that the whole world came from chaos, this swirling, primordial, cosmic soup, as Carl Sagan would put it. And then the Earth and the other gods and the universal forces came along to shape things. But the Milesians, they're not down with this kind of mythological explanation. They look around and they see a world and they don't see gods. They see wood, they see ships, they see earth, they see clay, they see houses, they see animals, they see matter. They see stuff. And so they're thinking, maybe in the beginning, it was also stuff. But what kind of stuff? What element could have given rise to the world as we see it? See, this is a rational approach to looking at the natural world, of reducing it, not to something supernatural, but to something finite. And it's a theme, this, isn't it, in human cultures? This idea of taking the multitude of things around us and trying to reduce them to the one thing, the one God, the one substance, the arche, the one law of physics, the theory of everything. It's like we have a need to deduce the one from the many. And to Thales of Miletus, the one was water. Now, from what we know of Thales, he was a genius, a true polymath, a renaissance man before the renaissance. So I guess you could call him a naissance man. He's known as a mathematician, and in that field, he's the first man in history to whom a definite mathematical theory has been attributed, Thales's theorem. As an astronomer, he famously predicted the eclipse of 585 BC, which is how we're able to date him. And before you just shrug that off as a bit of interesting trivia, just take a second to let it sink in. Just 500 years ago, we were such a bunch of fuckwits that you could barely say that the Earth traveled around the sun without being burned at the stake for it. And 2,600 years ago, this guy, Thales, is predicting a solar eclipse using his eyes, no telescope, no nothing, no instruments, just his eyes and his brain. These Greeks, man, I'm telling you, they, they, they really had something going on. Now, back to Thales. There's a story that kind of paints him as this stereotypical philosopher, you know, head in the clouds, all theory, always distracted. So he's walking around and he's probably looking at the stars or something, trying to predict the next eclipse. And he falls into a hole in the ground that he hadn't seen. And this uh, Thracian slave girl, she sees him and she starts laughing at him and says, dude, how are you going to figure out what's going on in the heavens when you can't even see what's on the ground in front of you? And the message is clear, isn't it? You know, philosophers, lol, sure, they're very smart and everything, but, you know, it's like they don't even really live in the real world. But despite what the story would have you believe about philosophers generally and Thales specifically, he was also very, very practical. He used his knowledge of geometry to calculate the distance of ships at sea using triangulation, which I'm sure would have been extremely helpful if uh, your city was under siege or naval blockade. And he also used his talents to get rich. He predicted that there was going to be an incredible olive harvest. So before the harvest came, he hired all the olive presses, you know, the stuff that you use to make the olive oil. He hired all the presses in town. And then when the harvest came and it was just as awesome as he predicted, he then rented out the presses to the highest bidder. He made a killing. And my personal favorite bit of sort of practical genius of Thales is how he managed to calculate the height of the pyramids in Egypt. 
Now, before I tell you how he did it, just take a moment to think about how you would go about this task. Measuring the height of the pyramid, you know, using you know, just a measuring tape or a ruler, or in his case, probably just string. What Thales did is he waited for the right time of day when the sun was exactly in the right position for his own shadow to be the same length as his body, and then he just measured the pyramid's shadow against the ground. I love this so much. It's a simple solution to a complex problem. They're the best kind of genius. But I still haven't mentioned what Thales is best known for in the field of philosophy, or rather his position in that story. Today, we mainly know Thales because of his answer to that question, the one we're exploring in this episode, about our origins. To him, the founding principle, the constitutive element, the original substance of the world was water. So imagine that, looking around this mysterious world and seeing all this stuff, you know, made of flesh and bone, of wood, of stone and clay, and saying that behind it all lies none other than water. Why would he have thought this? I guess partly tradition. In Greek mythology, water plays a very important role. In Hesiod, you know, chaos comes before anything else, but order was brought out of chaos in the ocean. And in that Greek mythology, the personification of the sea, the elemental god that embodies the sea, his name is Okeanos, which is the word that gives us ocean. Okeanos encircles the whole world and separates it from the underworld, from Hades. So Okeanos is almost like a, a boundary between our world and other dimensions. And it actually makes sense that this would be the case, right? That the Greeks would have the sea fulfilling such a big role in their mythology. Greece itself is an archipelago. And Greek colonies like Miletus, they were settled by seafaring people, by people who got in boats and traveled. Miletus specifically, though, because it was in Asia Minor, it was very close to Phoenician cities. You've heard of the Phoenicians, that great naval civilization. So to them and to the Milesians, the sea is where all the travel takes place. It's where all the trade happens. So it makes it even more reasonable that Thales would view the sea as a source of life. And then maybe, as we're told, some analogies would spring to his mind. You know, Turkey is one of the areas in the world with the highest level of seismic activity. It's a very earthquake-prone place. No doubt Thales will have been through a few quakes in his life. So imagine this. Maybe he's in the middle of a pretty scary earthquake and he's being thrown this way and that. And he's thinking, you know, this is exactly like being on a boat when the sea is a bit wavy and you're being jostled here and there and you have to hold on to something stable because you're unable to find firm footing. This feels just like that. I mean, after all, didn't Hesiod himself refer to Poseidon the god of the seas as, quote, the earth holder who shakes the earth. And maybe this is a eureka moment for Thales. The Roman philosopher Seneca says that Thales thought, quote, that the world is held up by water and rides like a ship. And when it is said to quake, it is actually rocking because of the water's movement. According to Thales, the world was like a wooden disc, a frisbee-shaped log, just floating on the water. So the world's foundation is literally water, just like a house's foundation is what holds it up. Water holds the earth up. Now today, we know this is bullshit. We know that there isn't water underneath the continents. But if you look at it one way, you could say that his idea predated the theory of continental drift by 2,000 years. And if you substitute water for lava, the world kind of is floating, isn't it? But to Thales, water isn't just the foundation of the world in terms of being underneath it, of holding it up. It's also the founding principle, that original element, that arche. Why? Well, I guess if you're looking for a single unitary building block of existence, you're looking for the one at some point, you're just going to have to find a way to explain how from this one thing, you get so many other different things. You get flowers, you get socks, you get burglars, you get laptops, you get wheelchairs, you get dogs. So whatever the basic element is, 
it has to have the ability to transform. And maybe Thales, who saw water as the bedrock of the world, would have noticed that water can change form. You know, it goes from liquid to vapor to solid when it freezes. So water has some kind of transformative power, just like an original element, an arche, would. So Thales is thinking water, it holds up the world, and moisture. Moisture brings life, you know, animals drink, they need moisture, plants, they need moisture, blood is moist, semen is moist. He must be seeing the pattern here, that water, that moisture is essential to life. So maybe that's how we get this strange theory that water is everything, that everything rests on water, that everything relies on water, that everything comes from water. Water is the origin of everything. Now, Thales is also known for another couple of obscure utterances that are quite interesting. I'll just go into them briefly. The first is the idea that magnets have souls. And by the way, isn't it just a little crazy to think that all those centuries ago, the Greeks already knew what magnets were? Now, it's not entirely clear what he meant with magnets have souls, but there is a certain trend in ancient Greek thought to equate life, and therefore souls, I guess, with motion. Even the word for a soul's highest expression, emotion, comes from the word motion, almost as if life and movement were one and the same. So because magnets could move each other, they must have had some kind of vital force, a soul, within them. And his second obscure utterance, which is related, is, everything is full of gods. Now what does Thales mean here? Does he mean some kind of animism? You know, like the spirit of the tree or the spirit of the river, something like that? Or is he using gods as a metaphor for something else? And if so, what is it a metaphor for? Are we talking about souls, like in the magnets? Is everything full of souls? Or is he talking about the building blocks of creation? Is he talking about the arche? Is he saying that everything contains the gods of water? There's elements in Thales that make him seem almost like a panpsychist. I'm projecting modern philosophical notions onto him now, but panpsychism is the idea that everything in the universe, starting with the basic constituents of matter, like atoms and electrons and other particles, they all possess some form of consciousness, just like Thales's magnets. Everything is full of gods. Okay. We've got a bit of an understanding of what Thales was all about, but hold on a minute. Water, eclipses, magnets. Is this philosophy? It's a difficult question to answer because what we mean by philosophy has evolved so much over the course of the centuries that the kind of questions Thales was asking and the way he was answering those questions is profoundly different from what a philosopher does today. In as far as the questions and answers are concerned, it's kind of more similar to what a physicist does today. But of course, Thales is working without the scientific method, empirical observation, inductive reasoning, experimentation. That's what we call science. If he's not doing these things, we can't really consider him a scientist. But we're talking about a time before the distinction in disciplines, before the specialization and the branching out of the various forms of knowledge. At this point, maybe there is no name for it. It's a bit philosophy, it's a bit theology, it's a bit science. But whatever it is, he's the first to be doing it in this form. He's the first to be looking out at the world, asking questions and finding answers using reason. The next in line in this succession of Milesian philosophers trying to figure out the origin of the universe is Anaximander. But I don't want to talk about him just yet, because in my view, he's the most interesting of the three, and he takes this line of inquiry off into a new and rather abstract dimension. So I'd rather leave him till last so I can expand and explore him in a bit more detail. So instead, now I'm going to skip Anaximander and tell you about his pupil, Anaximenes. Anaximenes is also interesting because he's a step forward from Thales. He takes what Thales is doing and moves it further along the line of scientific inquiry. So Thales, of course, had kicked off this whole line of rational inquiry into the world, kickstarting both philosophy and science in the process. But if you think about it, his theories on water 
don't really hold water. Now, don't look at it from our own perspective. Thousands of years after Thales, we know how the world works, or at least we have the broad strokes of it. We definitely know that the Earth isn't just a log of wood floating on water. For us, it's easy to see what's wrong with Thales' ideas. But if we sort of get into character, we put ourselves in the mindset of Thales' contemporaries, we might think of some objections they might have had to what he was saying. And one obvious objection to Thales is one that was raised by Aristotle, among others, and it's what's underneath the water. If you're saying that there's an element that is foundational, it also has to be a foundation to itself. It needs to be able to sustain itself. And that would require it to have some kind of boundless or infinite quality about it. And water doesn't quite seem to fit the bill. I mean, Aristotle just points out, well, if water is underneath the earth, what's underneath the water? What does the water rest on? Water isn't solving the problem of foundations, it's adding a new problem, namely, what does the water rest on? Anaximenes has a solution to this problem. To Anaximenes, the arche, the founding principle, the stuff everything is made of, is air. Now, if we just look at the problem in terms of the physical structure of the world, to Anaximenes, the Earth is a disk, just like Thales said. So, just like Thales, he's literally a flat earther. Except to Anaximenes, this flat Earth frisbee doesn't rest on water, but it rests on air. Kind of like the lid of a pot when you're boiling pasta and the steam pushes the pot upwards and, and you get these moments of equilibrium where the lid is hovering, held up by the steam and Anaximene says that that's how the earth works. And the reason this works better than water is because look at air. It's boundless, it's invisible, it's weightless. It would feel to an ancient as infinite, kind of like how empty space feels to us. Unlike water, air wouldn't need anything else to rest on. The foundation is the foundation because it can sustain itself. Just look at the difference here between all this reasoning by people like Anaximander and Aristotle later, all this justifying your theories, providing rational explanations, and how different it is to the Earth is held up by a giant called Atlas who carries it all on his shoulders. I mean, why would that possibly be the case? Why would you possibly believe that except for the fact that some king or some village elder said so? This is so different. It's riveting the need that these guys had to explain their ideas, to justify them, to, to defend them against rational probing. Anyway, so this guy Anaximenes, he's pointing at boiling water, at steam, at how the air pushes things up and saying that's the answer, not some crazy mythological nonsense that nobody can justify, but that, that's your answer right there. You can see it. You can question how it works and you can come up with an explanation. But what really makes Anaximenes a step forward from Thales is that he's less interested in the what. What are the building blocks of creation? What is the RK, whether that be water or air or some other element? And is more interested in the how. How does this RK give rise to all the many things we see around us? How does this element result in the other elements? How does the one give rise to the many? And to explain this, he talks about processes of condensation and rarefaction. And he proposes an experiment. So you can see from this that there's an approach that to us feels almost scientific. Processes, experiment, observation. And this is the experiment. He says, try blowing through pursed lips and you'll realize that the air coming through your mouth is cold. But try blowing through an open mouth and you'll realize that the air is hot. So there seems to be some kind of link between density and temperature. But it's not limited to temperature because think about what that implies. What is the hottest thing in the world that you can think of? Fire. And what's the coldest thing you can think of? Ice. Fire and ice. All arrived at through temperature which is linked to density. And these two things, they're not just a matter of different temperatures, hot and cold. Fire and ice are different elements. They're different kinds of matter. They're different textures and consistencies. So if there's a link between density 
and temperature, which is what we saw with that experiment of blowing through our pursed lips and open mouth, then could there also be a link between the process of condensation and its opposite, rarefaction, and the transformation of the elements into other elements? And Anaximenes says, of course there is. So you start with one element, air, which Anaximenes thought was the founding element, and if you condense it, it becomes water, it becomes liquid. Today, we even call the little droplets of dew that we find on plants in the morning condensation. And if you take water, if you take liquid, and you condense it further, well, what does water become when it becomes more dense? Ice, solid. And that, to the Greeks, is the element of earth. Just a little bit of explanation here. When we're talking earth in the ancient sense, we're not talking about soil and stone and the ground. We mean earth as in solid, as opposed to the liquidity of water, to the gaseousness of air, and to, well, the fireishness of fire. And by the way, how do you get fire? Fire is rarefied air. It's air which is even less dense than air is. Just like when you rarefy the air through blowing through your open mouth, which means that the air molecules, the way we'd look at it, are less compressed, less compact, and it becomes warmer. Rarefied air becomes fire. So you can see why this is a leap forward from Thales. He too is talking about the basic matter of the universe, but he's also talking about processes. He's talking about the mechanics of how the universe comes into being and manifests itself to us the way we experience it, with all the diversity and all the different kinds of elements and textures and consistencies that we see around us. Another final interesting thing that I find in Anaximenes is the spiritual aspect, or at least what today we might see as a spiritual aspect in his philosophy. So to him, air isn't just the element air. There's something divine and spiritual about it. To him, air is like a god. He calls it pneuma, life breath. Just like breathing is the difference between something being alive and dead, the whole world, according to Anaximenes, has this pervasive, dynamic, invisible, divine breath, pneuma, that makes it alive. It's kind of like the universe having a soul. And that soul being air, being pneuma, one could argue that Anaximenes might have seen us as all connected to the cosmos somehow, our individual breath being a microcosm of this larger cosmic breath. Similarly to how in the Hindu tradition there's a connection between the individual soul, Atman, and the universal divine soul, Brahman. They are all connected because they are the same thing, a single universal spirit, in this case breath, pervading the whole universe and connecting it into one great everything. And thus, finally, we reach Anaximander, easily the most interesting philosopher you've never heard of, and the first one to take philosophy into the realm of the abstract, which is Definitely a quantum leap for the whole discipline, because the philosophers he's working around, his uh, immediate successors and also predecessors like Thales, well, they're something closer to what we'd consider scientists today. They're talking about what we'd consider to be elements and chemical processes. But Anaximander is taking philosophy into something that we recognize today as philosophy or at least metaphysics, the study into the nature of ultimate reality, of pure being. You'll see what I mean in a moment, but first let me just briefly introduce Anaximander with a few factoids about the guy. So he's a pupil of Thales, and just like his great teacher, he's a polymath and a proto-scientist. He too is credited with a number of inventions, like uh, the Greek version of the sundial, the gnomon. So that, of course, is the vertical rod or triangle which is raised from the ground and casts a shadow on a flat plane depending on the position of the sun in the sky. And from that shadow you can tell the time of day or of year, etc., etc. So that's something he introduced in the West. He also uh, was the first person, it said, to 
produce a map of the earth and the sea and the inhabited world as it was known to them at the time. So in that sense, you could see him as the first cartographer. And in the tradition of his teacher Thales predicting an eclipse, Anaximander is said to have predicted an earthquake, famously saving Sparta by telling them to take cover and refuge before a particularly big one was to hit. And then there's a couple of scientific theories Anaximander is credited with that give us a glimpse into the modernity of this guy and his thought. Following on from Thales and the idea that everything comes from water, Anaximander guessed that animals and human beings too originally came from water. And we of course know this now to be true, you know, the first uh, creatures living on land came onto land from the sea. But he took it a step even further. So reflecting on the particularly long infancy of human beings and that period of time where humans are particularly vulnerable far longer than most animals, Anaximander hypothesized that we can't always have been exactly the way we are, or we just would have been killed in one of those long periods hey guys, of vulnerability and we never would have made it this far. So Anaximander says we can't have begun our existence as so far, 22 beings. victims, Must many of whom were children and teenagers. And in being. the meantime, a suspect 23-year-old man named Salman Abedi water. has been Isn't apprehended and the UK has raised the terror alert to the highest level of Isn't it insane meaning how that this man another attack just using may his be imminent? With no Happy Wednesday, everyone. Long tradition of scientific so yesterday I talked a little about what we should from, consider as terrorism so close and how to reason about this Islamic connection, of all time. if there even is one. Another theory yeah, that there is, but let's be reasonable about it, is his idea and I got a few call-ins about it, which is so uh, great, his because this situation we're facing is something we really need to discuss together if we have any hope of his successor, Maximilian, said that it was a flat the disc are also uh, floating but on matter. air. Patrick, but Anaximander says that the world isn't floating or resting on anything I at all. Instead, it's suspended at the exact center of the universe. The so reason it's suspended and stays where it is is because it's at equal distance from all the extremities of the universe. It is, it's equidistant from everything so else, so it's in perfect equilibrium. By the history now I'm sure you can see the modernity incident, of this idea, so of this geometric the conception the of the universe, the news, this concern for proportionality. It kind of predates Newton and his idea of uh, gravitational of forces and the push and pull of different bodies on each other keeping them in this state of fragile equilibrium and Thank you, Tzvi, and uh, you guys on Tzvi's station uh, were saying that his daughter, the only way you can have psychiatrist, is if was interviewed is on a radio in New York but yesterday, here he telling it wrong, parents because uh, about to an how Lester the world to talks to children like a drum, a about silly, these type of events and how to conceptualize it and minimize and trauma. trauma. So that's we're quite interesting, and I'm one. sure Tzvi will be happy to talk to you about it if you find his station and ask nicely. Presumably anyway, Tzvi was agreeing with what I said yesterday about the definition of terrorism, the case, but I wonder if maybe I'm wrong about this. So a few days but ago, anyway, I was on another station an idea here of an Anchor, and, and the, the host was talking about the Times Square attack from he was. last week. But and he was very really angry and saying about that this him. is 100% was the fact terrorism, that he there's was no way the this isn't terrorism. To and the put only forth question a genuinely was, metaphysical conception of the world, convert to Islam before he did it? Now, I found just this like Thales and just like Anaximander, an Anaximander so is fascinated with the problem why the host of the was so arc. sure it was terrorism, origins given that the, the definition of terrorism is an attack in pursuit of a political in fact, we're aim. The first one to and in the, the Times Square attack, attack, there is no indication, what and there still is no indication, that there was a political the objective. The so, how could the, the host be so adamant None. that this was definitely to terrorism and maybe even Islamic? As you can he's imagine, looking he at didn't the world, publish my call and in he's or seeing reply. it in terms of opposites. But I wonder, the succession of day because and clearly night, some of these other DIY cold, terrorists, dry versus you know, the ones who dark, grab a car or a knife, if the they are world clearly not on the same opposites. level as the highly organized paramilitary jihadists all of them. we see if you were taking like water the Paris as the principle, how do you explain attacks? dryness? They if seem disturbed rather than motivated by any political fanaticism. 
And that okay, element some of them would dominate Muslim, over its opposite, so it would then conquer everything else. All and the I get other that this is terrorism because although it so might not be the primary motivation of the attacker, single element. the political there motivation is still there. It just the belongs to the people who exploit the attackers. Something where all the other but what about cases like Ricardo Rojas? He's talking about a because deeper, there is more a mythology of, of terrorism that's being spun so he by the notion terrorist organizations and, and by our own media that has no qualities, which no in form, our celebrity no obsession culture, no boundaries, could be having a stronger impact boundless. than we think. And I wonder if, now, in the mind of a lonely and an unstable and uh, desperate eternal, man who's not got a lot going on in his life, again, kind of like how strong Sagan's that element soup, of this will put me on the map which all else might be. And to an Either way, this, this mythology of terrorism thought kind of emotion. fascinates me, so I'm going to and ponder it a little bit longer and then share my thoughts later. Off. In pairs I'm of Patrick, opposites, and this is the great hot and cold, dry and wet, fire and ice, light Guys, and I'm darkness. Talk more about this and all these opposites, they come into being for a while, they clash, but now maybe and then they return to this Aperon. To be and I'm not saying I got these born answers, again. but I am saying that I spent a day this thinking about cycle it, of and I've come up with something that I think that makes world, sense as a coherent theory. Plural, by the way, because to and an I'm an also not saying that I came up with this, because experts and psychologists and all people way smarter than born me, including many of you, born have probably figured all of this out There's this fragment ago. written by an But right now, you don't have people way smarter than me, you've got me, so here's my It says, quote, into that I'm asking from which the question, take their rise, what state of mind away once must one inhabit in order to be willing and to ready to commit each other's brutal injustice atrocities, in accordance with both the at one's of own instigation and at the instigation this idea of, of others? Injustice in Greek, and on the back of that, has terrorism transcended Islam? On each other. And I've systematized so it into one two causes heat, and two cold, light, dark. And they're all intermingled. It begins to encroach the two causes are the other. lack of meaning to take more than its and hatred share. of being. And then what happens is and there's the two a pushback outlets are both the other opposite. The Jihadism, seasons marching into one another, or the wave retreating before it crashes onto the shore, the next few segments and it's this eternal cycle in our until each of these pairs of lack of meaning that, to an extent, we all experience. Do you and that see when that lack of meaning is, is taken to the between, extreme, hey, some of us can comes from fall into a downward you know, spiral and into the darkest and side of this, our humanity. This idea of an eternal cycle of birth and destruction itself. that sounds kind of like samsara when one is you know, in the that cycle of karma, hell, it's all just so much hate grander and devoid of all meaning. That's come before. For those of us within a certain culture, of the jihadism can be an easy way to conceptualize that internal hell, providing a convincing narrative and justification. And more importantly, a way out at uh, the beginning of his famous in a word, book on meaning being. and time and, uh, and this is obviously compounded by our obsession as with the celebrity for celebrity's of the sake concept of and with the way media coverage appears to glorify before an Aximander and around an Aximander it's obviously a huge topic and I'm going to break it up into separate multitude of so all I would ask is that you please listen till the end them in terms of and get the whole music processes etc hopefully this will provide some clarification is talking about what existence capital E existence or if nothing else actually is just some better questions and this we're asking being, the question, this what is the mindset is of terrorism? The abstraction what is the place of all form that one needs you to can't go even to imagine it, you can't even visualize to be able it. to got no tap qualities, into no way of being the desire it's to commit an atrocious act. Specifically and nothing, the first cause also that I've identified the time. is the pervasive Aristotle lack of meaning it in our culture. Idea where the and this is something that we will all intuitively like understand, and but not just those of us who suffer from depression or other similar ailments. But we are going through a states. period of cultural depression and this in between and personal and this cultural weird lack unity of identity, everything and nothing, lack of purpose it's within our lives. That's something where that I like to talk about and that I abandoned my career because without of being a banking lawyer didn't in any give me particular purpose. specific way. The fact and that we are I find ever more disconnected from our today, community, you look at this also gives of the purpose. world, and but say, when all well, you see every day like is just people staring into these black mirrors on their screens, even in restaurants, couples just not even 
talking to each of other. World Everyone is, is just a conception that is purely intellectual. By their There's phone. no empirical Everything observation, no way you can look out of your window and see something that gives you the so idea of personal, everything and nothing at the same time, or are infinity, or absence that is of qualities and form. To a lack He's of meaning. thinking in a way that is purely We have abstract. lost faith in our institutions, and that's why and this seems a slow just more since Watergate when we learned that we couldn't trust our precedents anymore. And another All reason way I'm always so the excited to Iraq think about war an Axe Mass Destruction an scandal is that as someone who lack of you know, faith went through in a whole culture, stoner phase and because now the philosophy of postmodernism tells I'm drawn us that to any there is no true world that our culture doesn't stand for anything positive that we have one, only brought you know, death and destruction one. and oppression into and I'm the world fascinated and that by there's how nothing worth saving we live in an oppressive time again racial supremacist patriarchal almost as if this dictatorship were responding to we are all inherently bad and that each of us is responsible the world for the sins of our forefathers, like genocide, like Here slavery. You have we live in an age in which we look at ourselves in the mirror opposites. and all we feel all is shame, all we are one told source. to feel shame. And the default position in this postmodern world is that Hindu you are a bad person. Where there is one a universal sinner. reality, it's pretty which much is both just the like source of being and being but without the redeeming figure of Christ that can save you and give you that purpose. This is something that then, Nietzsche warned about. A when Nietzsche said God is dead, he didn't mean that literally God world, has died. He said that the scientific revolution that began with people like Descartes and Newton world and that slowly led to the enlightenment the illusion, and the discovery Maya. that it is and human course, values and not religious values that should take uh, precedence. He said, beware, cut off from because when you remove God, part of the ultimate you reality. also have to remove but all Whichever the things it is, that we believe that are based that we're talking about on those Christian values, where there's there a will come a point between which you will start to true, question what is real, everything. Which is you will start to question and what is false, or you will what start is to question your product, own very goodness, which is duality, because you're which saying is that God is dead and it's all science now. And even but if you haven't looked at what happened between the lies when you really take that to its end world there as well in, in Genesis, you in the Bible, God, you are looking at a what initial state of oneness, Western society together unity with the ultimate spiritual and reality, which is God, and gave the metaphorically coup de that's presented as the Garden of Eden, leaving us where in a marriage that is totally united with God, of meaning, in a state of bliss. Some of you unfortunately experience that every day. And then I know many people separation, are depressed, sundering, severely depressed. We get and kicked out. Lack of meaning the characterizes their day-to-day -day life. And why? Some of you only because feel it saltuarily. Some of you only feel it when you're having a bad day, or when you're at your job. Good and evil. But the truth is, it duality. doesn't take a lot to look Before, around when we're on the there subway, was no good or, evil. or when we switch on our there computers was just or televisions, there was or when God. we're walking was around the, the streets, to notice but after the lack of meaning of good and in our evil, culture is indeed pervasive. Of duality. And so we need to ask ourselves, ourselves where the physical that can world lead us. of opposites and of when you lack evil, purpose in your life pain and labor and what childbirth. do you turn to to take its right, place so maybe i'm reading a bit too to much fill into that it, void. but it's a theme and that i think the tragic events of manchester and, and, and many Amanda other events is like the first it time we see it stated so years. explicitly are an indication tradition. of at least one pre-socratic philosophers where are lack of fascinating and important in my exploration because they are such a remarkable anticipation of I've identified a first cause that we can know lead what was one before them. to go down that we dark road coming next. and it's the pervasive so lack of meaning really in our society the courage, the but of course that can't be the full picture because we all feel that lack of meaning to an extent is and even massive in the worst the most extreme cases because he sees the outcome can be suicidal Thoughts, the which is for terrible, of course, can be found but it's not the same itself. thing as no taking out a bunch of innocent people with other with you. explanations from that outside That requires something nature. else. That requires something and more. And pushes forward this The psychologist this Jordan Peterson says that when people are afflicted by a deep lack of meaning for by means and of other negative circumstances in their like lives, like and abuse, for instance, but not necessarily anything quite that violent, they can turn to inward brooding and enter into what he calls a chaotic domain had. within their mind. Sure, these guys did seem a kind to have of thinking kind of that is tortured of the world. and self-mutilated. I mean, and in that, and that domain, that domain speaks of air your thoughts God. can take but a really dark turn to some towards a kind of, of the voluntary, religion, conscious they destructiveness, are a downward spiral towards what we would call evil. And we have to understand we all have that within us.
that call to have the greatest that's how you can get what people can who really up to that point had been relatively normal turning into cruel vicious in guards in concentration an camps to anaximenes that's how you get the events of the stanford the prison experiment which my friend m from house of m recently reminded and me backing of. up their disagreement this dark mindset is characterized by so this ideological is completely different from a religion check, or a cult great where pride, the leaders teaching resentment and, dogma, and vengefulness and any departure from now, this just a word on pride for a heresy. Those of you who have read Milton's kind of Paradise Lost know that and all it's the story of how Lucifer became Lucifer. Was he was a prideful angel who rebelled against God and was banished along. because They're of it. All harkening back to that and here's what he was rebelling against. He was rebelling against people telling him what to do. Because he felt like God. No, he says it, I feel like guys, God. I feel that everyone is beneath master. me. No disrespect. But the fact he is that his vision, his sense of self is refuted by reality because he isn't because God. it hands us a tradition he feels like a god but there is a real god above him. argumentation this is the same not thing just eric tolerated, harris but the columbine shooter talks about in his As writings Popper put it, he says it leads I to the realization I better that our than attempts all these to other find people. the truth are not why final, didn't you treat but me like i was better why didn't you turn to me for guidance why didn't you seek me out why didn't you invite me to stuff he quote knew that he was better than everyone else but his life wasn't criticism of someone who's better because he was a loser. He was someone who didn't get invited to parties. He never had sex. The so there's this cognitive dissonance between the incredibly arrogant sense of oneself as we know and today. a lived experience that is yeah, not right. up to one's own standards yeah, for where one should I hope be. You today's episode of the Great and if you're everything. in this place, and if you suddenly like the, the world starts to look like it's tragic you can leave because you're not getting what you want, anywhere else you and the world starts looking like it's unfair because you deserve to be on top, yet you're at the bottom. Can call in and you start to feel anger. that this unfairness and tragedy the various is a and cosmic conspiracy out. against I hope you. I see you again here and there, that or anywhere can else turn into it. hatred of That's being it. itself. Well, even Not just you your being, reach. but of being, capital B, a hatred of existence. And in that space, you want to punish the world. The podcast world. you just heard was published with Anchor. You want to anger. annihilate Got yourself, you want to say to the destroy your this own show? being. Send them a voice because message that's better than the being Anchor alive in a world that you now Android. see as your enemy. But you want to take other people.